Hey, 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 guys. It's been a minute, so I thought I'd do a video. Um, I noticed that there are several new videos out about Rosemont, and I don't know if that's because there are several new people that have kind of come onto the scene about Kanika Jenkins, um, even though this happened a year and a month ago, roughly, or if we were still going to beat the dead horse. So I thought I would clarify a few things. Just because I've heard some um, inaccurate information. Excuse me. Um, the village of Rosemont, which is where Kanika Jenkins' body was found in the freezer at the Crown Plaza, is actually part of Cook County. I saw something that said it was not, and it is. Um, it's actually northwest of the city of Chicago. And it is the village of Rosemont, rather than the city of Rosemont or the town of Rosemont, because... A village in Illinois, what makes a village a village is the fact that it was the date of incorporation. It has nothing to do with the population making it a village or anything else. It simply is the date of incorporation and whether or not it falls under the, um, I think it's like the city and co some kind of township act. Anywho, I don't have that information, but... I could get it if I needed it. Um, the, it. A village has to have exactly six trustees. So, Rosemont has exactly six trustees. And I will show you. The, let's see, the village. Okay. Okay, there's, there are six trustees are listed there under village board members. Uh, Di Matteo, Dorgan, Fazio, Hasselberger, Pappas, and Manali. And the reason Rosemont comes up in a lot of scandals and controversy is because it is full of nepotism. And anytime you involve nepotism, there's always going to be a question. That means there's really no checks and balances as far as anything goes in that town, village, my, excuse me. So I'm going to show you what the what a good definition of nepotism is for those that don't know. And if you don't know, that's fine. But I'm going to learn you something today. Nepotism, the practice among those with power or influence of favoring relatives or friends, especially by giving them jobs. Um, it's kind of like when you're at a football game and the quarterback really stinks. I mean stinks. And everybody's wondering why in the hell this quarterback's in the game when your star quarterback is essentially riding the pine over on the bench. But the reason that that quarterback's in the game is because his dad's the coach. Kind of the same thing. So, this stinky quarterback's in the game because his daddy is the coach. So, it's kind of the same thing. Um, you got the Stevens family pretty much running the entire village of Rosemont. And their friends work in the government. <clears throat> just... From pretty much any office, you you name it, they're in it. So, that makes it really, really bad. There's no checks and balances in that government at all. Um, let's see. Is that out of the way? There was a study on... It was actually a study. Let me go to the top. Study, study on corruption highlights Niles Blasse. Okay, this is from Niles, Illinois. It's an UIC study on corruption in the suburbs, cities, examples in Niles, Des Plaines, and Rosemont. And it calls for an inspector general and ethics training for suburban leaders. And they specifically have a section on here. It's on patch.com. Excuse me. That shows Rosemont. And I'm just going to briefly skim the article. I apologize for those that don't like me reading, but... I just want to make sure I get it across. Uh, it says, Donald Stevens served as mayor of Rosemont from 56 to 2003. And he helped transform Rosemont from a small subdivision into a booming suburb. However, many of the beneficiaries of village contracts under Stevens' administration had business or family connections to the mayor. In the 80s, four firms owned by Stevens' relatives received millions of dollars in city business contracts without a competitive bidding process. So like here in Kentucky, when we have a project, the contractors all bid and 
it goes to the lowest bidder, and they're the ones that do the project. So, anyway, for example, the mayor's daughter-in-law, Catherine Stevens, was a part owner of two firms, O'Hare Telecommunications, Inc., and Professional Signs, Inc., that had village contracts to provide services at the Rosemont Exposi Exposition Center. Likewise, three firms owned by Stevens' business associates received more than $18 million worth of contracts to expand the Rosemont Exhibition Center in the 80s. Catherine Murphy Interiors LTD, a firm owned by Mayor Stevens' wife, Catherine Stevens, received more than $1 million worth of village contracts for interior decorating between 98 and 2001. In 2000, a company owned by the mayor's son, Mark, received $3.8 million for cleaning and supervising the parking at several village properties and facilities. Um, Mark Stevens' company, Beaumark Inc., had similar contracts with the village dating back to the mid-80s. This nepotism remained as prevalent under Rosemont Mayor Bradley Stevens as it was before his father died in 2007. In 2010, 10 members of the Stevens family received a combined $950,000 from the village. Mayor Stevens received a $125,000 salary. Donald Stevens, the brother of Bradley Stevens, received a $144,885 salary as the police superintendent. Convenient. His son, Donald Stevens III, received a $140,613 salary as first deputy police superintendent. The mayor's cousin, Christopher Stevens, received a $193,462 salary as the head of the village's convention center. And it says here, in addition to the Stevens family, several other village employees had ties to Rosemont leaders. Harry Pappas, who was married to village trustee Sharon Pappas, was the highest paid village employee in 2010 with a $230,000 salary for running the Allstate Arena. City records showed that Rosemont clerk Deborah Dreholb and village trustees Ralph DiMatteo, Karen Fazio, and Jack Hasselberger also all had family members who worked for the village in 2010. So do you see now where the nepotism comes in? They're everywhere. They're from the mayor to the police superintendent to the first deputy police superintendent to the head of the village's convention center. I mean, they're everywhere. So it's kind of hard to have a checks and balances system when the entire family is in the government. Like, what do you do? When one of them comes up short, do you think they call the other one and say, hey, we're going to have to have a meeting? No, they do not do that. So that's a big problem. Um, now, let me close some of these out. Um, you know, there's a lot of conspiracy theories, if you will, about the Kanika Jenkins case. And you can pretty much back up several of those with actual facts. <laughs> That's what makes this case so unique. Um, strangely unique. But, um, for example... You know, they had the body brokering thing there that um, was uncovered Biological Resource Center of Illinois. And that actually happened there. So you can use that information to kind of go with the theory of it was body stuff going on. Body snatching. Um, this is from the ABC 7 News out of Chicago. And I can show this video if it'll let me. So that you can see. Developing tonight, we have new details about the alleged sale of body parts. So the feds are leading an ongoing investigation here in the Chicago area, as well as in Detroit and in Phoenix. You might remember back in January, federal agents raided businesses in Rosemont and in Schiller Park. Eyewitness News reporter Eric Kong has been digging through some newly unsealed documents. Eric? Alan, selling human remains is not illegal in itself, but federal authorities say those businesses misled donors and knowingly sold body parts that were infected with disease. 
On a cold day last January, federal agents swarmed two suburban businesses, a Schiller Park crematorium and the Rosemont Office of Biological Resource Center of Illinois, which arranges body donations for medical research. These newly unsealed federal documents detailing what was allegedly found. Thousands of body parts and tissue samples, everything from heads and hands to legs and torsos, all part of an alleged body broker ring that illegally obtained and sold human remains on the black market. Federal authorities say the operation came to light after scores of body parts were found on ice instead of embalmed in warehouses in Detroit and Phoenix. Some of the remains infected documents show with HIV, hepatitis, and other diseases, but nonetheless sold for medical training to hospitals and doctors in the U.S. and overseas. The feds say those body parts were supplied by Biological Resource Center of Illinois and that the company lied to its donors, promising remains would not be sold. But financial records obtained in those January raids show whole corpses were routinely sold for $5,000, arms for $750, and heads for $500. Named in the documents are the father and son owners of Biological Resource Center and that Schiller Park crematorium, Donald A. Green and Donald A. Green II. Their attorney in an email tonight saying, there is significant information missing from the affidavit that provides a fuller picture of the standards and practices employed by BRCIL. Those standards and practices are in line with industry standards. That attorney says Biological Resource Center has been cooperative with investigators. Those documents are related to the search warrants that were executed, not a criminal complaint, and no charges at this time have been filed. Cheryl, back to you in the studio. All right, Eric, thank you. So that kind of gives you um, the example of the body brokering and where that came in. A lot of people on that conspiracy side think that Kanika was sold um, to someone and the reason that that comes up is because there was a body broker ring that originated well maybe not originated but was actually run out of Rosemont, the village of Rosemont out of a business called Biological Resource Center of Illinois and you'll also hear the names um, Donald A. Green and Donald A. Green the second come up um, a lot of people say they've identified them on camera on the videos that were provided by the Crown Plaza. Not saying it did or didn't happen. I'm just telling you where that kind of came from. Um, I watched Azaria's, I think that's how you say her name, Azaria's video where she had a breakdown of epic proportion and said that um, Kanika was a victim of gang stalking. And, you know... A lot of people don't even know what gang stalking is. So, I kind of wanted to touch on that. Um, this kind of gives you... this. I'll just read this story to you. I live in a lovely lake community where many wonderful people live. However, amid all of the wonderful people is a group of at least eight misguided and sadistic people who have chosen to gang stalk two of their original or two of their other neighbors on the block. Gang stalking is a known phenomenon which can be difficult to believe and even harder to prove. It involves a group of people who band together for the purpose of targeting another individual or individuals in order to control aspects of their targets, victims, lives, and to monitor them 24-7. I have been witnessing this happening to my friends since June the 1st, but they have been experiencing the daily stalking since 2011. The victims of the gang stalking have tried seeking relief through police reports and civil complaints that have gone to court, but nothing has changed. My friends have had their house up for sale for over a year because they feel it is the only way to escape the daily starting, daily staring and leering and name calling that they hear as soon as they step out onto their own deck. The gang has even gone so far as to call the police to make a false report against my friends in an attempt to get them in trouble. We wonder what they will do next. My friends have had no privacy in their own home for nearly two years now. The main perpetrator in the gang has deliberately turned his yard across the street into a terrible eyesore, which is intended to make it harder for the victims to sell their lovely lake for at home. Why would a group of seemingly normal adults in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s band together for the purpose of taunting and harassing two other senior citizens? I wish I knew. Because the gang's behaviors are not, quote, criminal acts, the police are limited as to what they can do, and the matter is complicated by the fact that the foremost member of the gang has a family connection with the local police department. Because I see and know what is going on, I have spoken with several, with some other lake residents, who thus far are unable to believe what I tell them. 
Sadly, the gang members have told so many lies to so many other residents that they mistakenly believe that my friends are the troublemakers, when in fact they are just trying to cope with the daily taunting without becoming even more distressed and depressed about it. I continue to advocate for my friends and have sought assistance from various local, county, and state agencies. I would ask that everyone who reads this letter please try to keep an open mind and please do not condemn my friends whose lives have been nearly destroyed by their own neighbors. Neighbors. Okay, then <clears throat> I found another article that was pretty interesting. It's a little lengthy, but it's definitely worth the read. Who gang stalkers are and how they are trained. Most people know a tar what a targeted individual, T.I., is, but I will define a T.I. before I define gang stalker. A targeted individual is a person being anonymously harassed by an organized crime group because the organized crime group, group wants something from the individual. Now, a gang stalker can be defined as a targeted individual that has been broken down, corrupted, and conditioned to respond to RF signals to perform various criminal tasks for the organized crime group. Gang stalkers start out as targeted individuals who are harassed in numerous ways until they give in to the, quote, modern mob, the term I use for the organized crime group carrying out these assaults. Gang stalkers are broken down and trained in the following ways. Number one, gang stalking. This is used on gang stalkers in training. At first, to break, to break them down and get them to comply, and then it's used to train them by showing them what to do to others when they become gang stalkers. Number two, psychological terror. RF weaponry, like the microwave auditory effect, a.k.a. the fray effect, is used to constantly badger the individual, insult him, keep him sleep-deprived, keep him from thinking, keep him terrorized, and keep him dependent on the mobsters hitting him with RF we weaponry. It is exactly what destructive cults like the, quote, Moonies do to their trainees to brainwash them, but RF weaponry is now used. These techniques are used to make the individual obedient to the modern mob. Number three, Pavolian conditioning. Gang stalkers are put through endless drills to condition them. Pavlovian conditioning. Gang stalkers are put through endless drills to condition them to respond to orders automatically. They are conditioned in these drills by creating positive feelings with the RF rep weaponry when they do something right and the negative feelings when the RF weaponry when they mess up in a drill. And I'm assuming that Pavlovian conditioning comes from Pavlov and the dog with the bell, if you're familiar with that. Um, once a gang stalker has been sufficiently trained, then the modern mob can start using him or her when needed on demand to harass others and perform various criminal tasks. Here are some major ways the modern mob communicates with its gang stalkers. Um, RF weaponry. Cues in the environment. Electric, electronic cues. Uh, cue given to gang stalkers to check their cell phone and to specifically check the open Wi-Fi hotspot list. The group puts remote access software on the gang stalkers' phones. This allows them to create fake Wi-Fi SSIDs on the gang stalkers' phone to convey messages. Why do they do this? Because when you create a fake SSID, it conveys a message that leaves no record or trace and can be changed or removed instantly without raising suspicion in case the gang stalker's phone falls into the wrong hands. An example of Wi-Fi network placed into the gang stalker's phone. <clears throat> an, an example of Wi-Fi network placed into the gang stalker's phone to convey a message might be Orange Jacket 911 API. The gang stalker will be trained to know that this means run in and follow or say something to a target in an orange jacket. Uh, let's see. Once the gang stalker has been properly broken down, brainwashed, and conditioned to automatically respond to orders sent out by the modern mob, they have him perform a number of tasks on the mob's behalf. If the individual has a legitimate position in society in which the mob might find it useful to have him, then the gang stalker will continue life, life in that position. The modern mob has many uses for doctors, dentists, police officers, judges, politicians, and lawyers, which will be discussed in future articles. And... They can be conditioned like gang stalkers to respond to the mob's cues. However, the modern mob often does not let a targeted individual turn gang stalker return to his normal life, at least for a few years. These unlucky individuals are employed in a number of tasks to help the mob recruit others. Subjugate 
others, and extort money. These major tasks include, number one, harassment and gang stalking. Number two, extortion. A uh, major task of gang stalkers is to, is to convey over and over to business owners in sly, clever ways how much extortion money they owe the modern mob. For example, if a store owner is being extorted for $3,000, then countless gang stalkers will enter the business and buy three of an unusual item, ask for three business cards, wear a jersey with a number three, or carry three bags with them. This can go on for months with the clever means of execution are endless. Theft of Keys there's even a key icon in, on most T-Mobile phones and Intel PCs where the gang stalker's attention is focused by RFQs time and time again. The modern mob likes to supplement its on, anonymous harassment and RF weaponry assaults with the ability to break into the target of victim's home. This allows the mob to instill an extra sense of terror in their targets in order to bend them to their will. Most oftentimes, a gang stalker will simply be directed to steal small items like deodorant from a target's car or home, or just send a message of terror to break them down and make them sound crazy if they report it as stolen. I hope this gives you a better understanding of the modern mob and the system they have in place to spread their power. So, this is very common. <clears throat> and it's been going on for quite some time. This is not some new phenomenon. Um, but, there was another article on here. Let me see if this is it. Yes, this is it. Uh, be aware of human trafficking, gang stalking. This is from October the 15th, 2018. I came to the Garden Island newspaper to inform people of my situation that I'm in so as to help me and others. It's called human trafficking and or gang stalking. It is a billion dollar industry that targets people for various reasons, mostly for criminals, to make money off your life in any way they can. Everyone always asks, who are they? If I knew exactly who they are, I'd be able to get a restraining order. They do the harassment and targeting with many people, which is why it's called gang stalking. There has been a brief story on the news station a few years ago about it. Nothing is being done to fix it. When a victim tries to get help, they have their people in as police agents, lawyers, judges, etc. It is another form of organized crime with a twist of terrorism. The criminals make the victim look like they are crazy, on drugs, paranoid, or anything they can so you won't believe them or help them. That's how they are a billion dollar industry. Excuse me. Excellent at deception at making the victim look guilty of something. I know in my personal situation, they have lied to make me look like a pedophile, thief, abuser, hater, etc. So people will be nasty and ignorant and at times violent towards me. Then they, have, then they tell people it is me that is bad or have bad karma. I have excellent karma, or I wouldn't keep rising above the terroristic cultics, cultist tactics being used against me. They have destroyed my career of 17 years operating heavy equipment, destroyed my 18-year partnership with my wife and friend. <coughs> yes, I am lesbian. Much of this is because of that. <coughs> Excuse me. Homophobes assume all LGBT people are pedophiles. These guys have, quote, teams of people that handle smear campaigns to destroy reputations, businesses, families, friendships, and whatever else they can. They are destroyers, not builders of love, faith, and hope. People have told me sometimes of what was said to them. An example is a woman I was working with who told me that she was told to lie to help me get fired, to help get me fired. Then she never spoke to me again as if she was afraid. Many people have been brave enough to tell me, but many have not. I have been on the island of Kwa Kwahe, for eight days. I know I'm saying that wrong and I apologize. The same harassment has already started here with trying to interfere in my job prospects. I passed all drug, sec drug tests and passed interviews the third day that I was here. The fifth day, the same guy that said he'd put me to work couldn't believe that my email with my resume was blocked from getting to him until I gave him real evidence from printing it and the rejection of it. I'm telling you this to let you know I am being stalked. <clears throat> excuse me, harassed and kept from working by people telling lies. I am not part of a game, team, volunteer, or anything like it for Hollywood or anywhere else. I have been to the police and FBI and other states to file complaints. I am trying to inform good people of the tactics of these terrorists so you can understand and know if it happens to you. I had a good life with a wonderful wife, an excellent career, lots of family, friends, and activities. 
All of this has been stolen by terrorists using cult tactics to try to force me to marry a man, have kids, and live a life other than what I have built for myself. I have a rainbow family, a brother-in-law that is half Japanese, two African-American sisters-in-laws, a nephew-in-law that is of Mexican descent. There isn't any group that I have been prejudiced against except the people that they are do that are doing this to me. The they are multicultural. <coughs> Excuse me again. It's not just one group doing this. In Hollywood, they consider a, it a, quote, game to do this to people. Human traffickers don't have age, color, or gender preference. It is evil, and evil doesn't have a color. I am going to go to a local police to file paperwork. The only thing I can do is to give up evidence when it comes up. They, ha they do have professionals who can track the cyber criminals doing the blocking of emails because it, because it gives them numbers and trails to follow. If these things are happening to you, please turn it in and follow through with trying to get these people put in prison where they belong. If any of their lies about me were true, I'd already have been in prison. They have the ability to make fake videos, fake news, and fake conversations, all of which I have been told by various people has been done to me. I am here for only good intentions of Highland Life of the Aloha Spirit with my beautiful future wife. I am looking for steady employment and staying in Kauai. I hope to be able to write more information about these topics from my personal experience of being the victim of gang stalking and human trafficking. <clears throat> so it does happen. So I'm sure you can find that video that Azaria uh, put out. I think she did it on like a social media account and someone recorded it. I'm not sure, but I'm sure it can be found. And that's where, that's why people are saying the gang stalking thing. So, so far we've got the corrupt police of Rosemont. We've got gang stalking. Um, we've got the body double. That's another conspiracy. And I can show you that. I wasn't ready to show you that, so let me, this is my actual Instagram, so, this is one of the girls that they claim was a body double, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice, I don't know why, but, probably because I haven't talked this much in a while, but anywho. Uh, this girl is the one that they said was possibly a body double. Um, let me see if I can find some of her pictures here. I don't know if that's her or not. Let me find one of her. Here's one of her. You guys can be the judge of that. She runs some kind of little clothing store. Um, she does hair. Of course, not all of them are her. Let me see if this is her. Yeah, that's her. I want to find a really good picture so you can kind of see her her face. See if this one will do it. Real classy. So you can kind of see. I want some of her older pictures where she doesn't have all that bangs in her face.
trying to show you all as much as I can <clears throat> because that's where a lot of the body double stuff came up because people were saying that wasn't Kanika because the jacket in the video and the jacket in the picture in the mirror were not the same. So, I mean, I could see similarities between this girl and Kanika. So, I'm not saying it is or isn't. I'm just showing you where some of these conspiracy theories have come from. <laughs> it's my birthday, my birthday at 12. Oh, y'all got the 24. And actually, one of the people that was discussed at the beginning, or toward the beginning of the Kanika case, <clears throat> who said that they either knew who did it or was there, I can't remember now, but, um, He's actually liking these videos. This RMG Fluky. So I thought that was a little bit interesting. And there was also a YouTuber. I won't name any names. Who said that. This person. Here. I got the truck in the front. Hope you hold no it ain't. This girl here, this Victoria Kenneth Jr., <laughs> um, was actually in pictures with uh, some of Kanika Jenkins' friends, Shemaya and some of them. So you can see the similarities between this girl and Kanika. And someone actually commented on um, one of her pictures or videos. That's obviously her there on the right. Someone actually commented on it saying, like, why are you trying to... Something about Kanika. video here <clears throat> that I just showed you actually looks like the same girl that was um, I don't know if some of you remember when the video of the girl that was being thrown over the shoulder of the guy at the party that was drinking this looks like her <laughs> I can't verify that for sure but definitely looks like her she definitely needs to keep her day job. Singing is not her thing. But, um, then you got like pictures like these. Where they're just dressed like that. Some of the older pictures really, really make her look like. Kaninka. I'm trying to go back pretty far. So, anywho. You can go look for yourself and see the similarities. Um... Between her and Kaninka. They're there. <clears throat> Definitely there. Especially some of her younger ones. Or older pictures.
I wish I could find the one I'm trying to show you guys. But anywho. Um, and she does have a connection to Chicago. So, found that interesting too. Cute girl. I probably never find that picture where people were commenting. <coughs> let me see how far down it'll let me go. I apologize for scrolling so fast. Because it has been a year and a half. What's the date on that? 2014. Okay, so I'm down far enough. <laughs> so she's definitely a close, not a dead ringer, but a close one. Kind of eerie, actually. A lot eerie to look at her, but could be a huge coincidence. Who knows? We may never know. So, that's where that's one of the people that they claim could be a body double for Kaninka. Um, let's see, so we've covered the gang stalking, we've covered, um, the body brokering, we've covered body doubles, um, I'm trying to think on the fly here. I'm trying to think on the fly, um. Anywho, um, we also have the Cook County Medical Examiner's Office and the controversy that surrounds them, which is horrendous. They have so much controversy and scandal um, around their office that it is ridiculous. Um, but back to the gang stalking thing, there was an article in there in one of those uh, gang stalking uh, websites explaining what gang stalking was that said that these gang stalkers train at facilities or businesses like this, which is EKS Group. Okay. And let's see. I found this interesting. EKS Group. It's basically like a gang stalking business. Okay. So. I'll tell you what this business is. Or what they say they are. It says they provide subject matter expertise with hundreds of years of experience. In areas surrounding intelligent operations. Intelligence operations. Law enforcement. Counterintelligence. Human intelligence. Information operations, counterterrorism, force protection, security matters, international diplomacy, and foreign area knowledge. Um, industry leader for sophisticated physical and technical surveillance operations and training support. They su 
Our teams perform over 75,000 hours of surveillance work annually with teams across the United States. In conjunction with our government clients, we are plank holders and laying the groundwork for advanced human intelligence training for controlled source operations and are called upon often to provide mobile training teams to coach, mentor, instruct DOD operational teams worldwide, which is the Department of Defense. Okay. Now, there is... When I went to their careers, I found this extremely interesting. Um... Let's see. Apply here. This just sounds... Okay. Surveillance uh, mm -hmm. role player. Let's just click on one of these. I'll do this first one. A surveillance role player. Okay. <clears throat> just look at this. Uh, it's very interesting. Job description. We have excellent opportunity. We have an exciting opportunity. This is a big old page here. Gotta make it where everybody can read. We have an exciting opportunity to join EKS Group as a member of surveillance role playing team conducting static, foot, and vehicle and or multi-mode surveillance of training personnel. We are looking for high energy candidates that can operate in urban and rural environments and under all weather conditions. Okay. The qualifications or skills. Maintain appropriate level security clearance. High school diploma. Generally physically fit with the ability to walk up to 18 miles per day for up to 12 consecutive days with the ability to drive or ride in a vehicle for up to 12 hours per day. Successful completion of a surveillance operations course. Two years of surveillance role playing experience may be substituted for the formal surveillance operation course requirement. Maintain a valid driver's license, current auto insurance, and a 36-month clean driving history. Ability to read, write, and speak English fluently. Ability to solve practical problems and deal with a variety of concrete variables and situations where only limited standardization exists. Um, all right. Duties. Perform foot surveillance up to six miles per run, up to three runs per day. Perform vehicle surveillance up to three hours per run, up to four runs per day. I found that to be extremely interesting. Especially if you're going with the gang stalking conspiracy theory on the Kanika Jenkins case. And if you go with that, then this group is actually a trainer or part of the gang stalking. And this job, six surveillance role players, is very interesting. What is also interesting... And I'm not prepared for this. So if you see a picture that is crazy, just ignore it. <laughs> um, I have a screenshot of the gentleman that... Let me see if I can find it. Here he is. This gentleman, <clears throat> um, which is also, I guess, kind of part of the body brokering thing. They... The hotel, the Crown Plaza, this guy was the director of food and beverage, was a director of food and beverage at the um, Crown Plaza, Lenny Pasias. And if you look down here, if I can get this to pop up, probably won't be able to. If you look, well, I don't have my pencil out. The former, he was former military intelligence at the U.S. Department of Defense. And I thought that was very, very, very interesting. And if you look here, here he is in a picture with NYPD. I mean, who just walks up to the NYPD and takes a picture? I thought that was pretty interesting. So, that's another part of the conspiracy theory, see? Um... Okay, back, there was also another business that was supposed to train these gang stalkers. But I will have to come up with that on another video. Back to the Cook County Board uh, Medical Examiner's Office. This is just from October the 7th. <clears throat> Pres County Board President Tony 
Preckwinkle says she believes abandoned security SUV found with political materials was stolen. Okay. Cook County Board President Tony Preckwinkle said she believes the county SUV used nearly exclusively by her security chief and found abandoned in the early morning hours after the 2016 election with campaign materials in the back was stolen, even though officials never reported it to police. You think it's a little strange? Preckwinkle also said she has not investigated the incident and declined to comment on whether she has asked her security chief whether he placed the political materials in the vehicle, saying she won't discuss personnel matters. So you're telling me that you didn't ask your security chief about an incident that happened uh, two years ago <laughs> where an SUV was stolen? Come on, ma'am. Come on with the jokes. Instead, reiterated her spokeswoman's statements from earlier in the week that she does not allow county vehicles to be used for, quote, the dissemination of campaign materials, end quote, but doesn't know who placed the materials in the vehicle. Quote, my conviction is that it was stolen, end quote, Preckwinkle, a candidate for mayor of Chicago said of the vehicle. That's as far as I intend to comment on it. Okay, so, like, that is just the craziest thing I think I'd ever read. Um, you can go and read this article. It was on the Chicago Tribune. I'm sure you can type in her name, and I'm sure a ton of articles will pop up. But she is, um, I want to make sure I get her. Ties to this. I thought this was interesting. Um, she is the board president. And she has a lot to do with the medical examiner's office. Okay. Uh, the Cook County, this is from June. It's from Chicago Sun-Times. From June of this year. Faced with the medical examiner's routine failure to visit death scenes, Cook County Board President Tony Preckwinkle is moving to do away with that requirement. So, instead of getting pissed off that these people are dying and nobody's showing up on the scene as is protocol. She's just going to do away with that requirement. So <laughs> that's just crazy to me. It says they failed to abide by a requirement that it send an investigator to the scene of every suspicious death, including all homicides and suicides. Now saying it can't afford to do that. Cook County board president, Tony Preckwinkle has come up with a Chicago style solution water down the county ordinance that requires the on-site visits. The ordinance says a medical examiner's representative shall go to the location of the body and begin an investigation with an examination of the scene, though the agency and Preckwinkle dispute that that's a requirement. Still, Preckwinkle is moving to change the ordinance so the office instead will be given discretion about whether to make a scene examination based on generally accepted guidelines for conducting medico-legal death investigations. The change will clarify that scene investigations are assigned as necessary and at the discretion of the medical examiner, just like autopsies. Preckwinkle and Dr. Pani Arunkumar, the chief medical examiner she hired, have maintained that they would need more staff and that it would be too costly for the county, facing an anticipated budget shortfall next year of $82 million, to get someone to the site of each suspicious death in Chicago and the Cook County suburbs. And that is a picture of Dr. Pawnee Arukumar. It is the goal of the medical examiner's office to continue to increase scene investigations because such investigations can assist the forensic pathologists in their tasks. So, and it says the Chicago Sun-Times reported in February of this year, over a three-year span, that there were 130 days when the agency's investigators didn't go out on even one death. 130 days and no one from the medical examiner's office went out on any kind of suspicious death or homicide or suicide or any of that. And it says even on cases that were found to be homicides, suicides, and accidents. Overall, the medical examiner's office went to fewer than one in every five death scenes. One in every five death scenes in Chicago? Come on, man. Thousands of bodies a year are brought to the county morgue on the west side so the medical examiner's pathologist can perform autopsies or less intrusive examinations to determine how they died. Their rulings often influence whether and how the police investigate those deaths. 
like just so you can see obviously where the Cook County Medical Examiner and the autopsy of Kanika Jenkins comes into play. If you guys can't even go out and investigate suspicious or homicides or suicide deaths, what else are y'all missing? Like, that's just a very basis, very basics of medical examiner stuff. So what else are y'all missing? Are you performing the autopsies? Or are you saying that you did and not doing it? I mean, you've got a million questions you could ask behind that. So that's where the autopsy um, information that was contained in the autopsy of Kanika Jenkins, how that comes into question and becomes part of the conspiracy theory. So it's like, it's like a perfect storm of conspiracy theories, basically. So anywho, I just thought that I would kind of bring this um, stuff to the forefront. I know it's it's been talked about and talked about to death, but, excuse the pun, but, um, I know there are a lot of new people coming on the scene and kind of wanted to, I've listened to some of their stuff and read some of their comments in chat and it's just been kind of going over the same stuff. So, anywho, I know this is kind of lengthy, but I'm going to end it on that note and, um, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I'll have another one soon. Bye.